the court's ruling, meaning the Supreme Court's ruling or resolution. Substan substantive issue, validity of Zaida's dismissal. A, burden of proof in dismissal situations. In every dismissal situation, the employer bears the burden of proving the existence of just or authorized cause for the dismissal and the observance of due process requirements. This rule implements the security of tenure of the constitution by imposing the burden of proof on employers in termination of employment situations. The failure on the part of the employer to discharge this burden renders the dismissal invalid. Articles 282, 283, and 284, now Articles 286, 297, and 298 of the Labor Code enumerates the grounds that justifies the dismissal of an employee. These include serious misconduct or willful disobedience, gross and habitual neglect of duty, fraud or willful breach of trust, commission of a crime, and causes analogous to any of these, all under Article 282. Closure of establishment and reduction of personnel under Article 283 and disease under Article 284. Article 277, now Article 291 of the Labor Code and Books 5 and 6 of the Omnibus Rules implementing the Labor Code, on the other hand, lay down the procedural requirements of a valid dismissal. These are 1. Written notice specifying the ground for grounds for the dismissal. 2. Ample opportunity for the employee to be heard and defend himself. And three, written notice of termination stating that upon due consideration of all the circumstances, grounds have been established to justify this, his dismissal. We, meaning the Supreme Court, recognize in this respect that of these two requ requisites for a valid dismissal, the presence or absence of just or authorized cause is the more critical crucial. The absence of a valid cause automatically renders any dismissal action invalid, regardless of the employer's observance of the procedural due process requirements. B. Presence or absence of valid cause for the dismissal. Based on the notice to explain and on the termination letter, we find that St. Vincent essentially dismissed Zaida for 1 engaging in intimate out of wedlock relationship with Marlon, which it considered immoral. Two, for her failure to disclose the relationship to the management, an omission violating its non-fraternization policy, which it characterized as gross misconduct. And three, for violating its code of conduct, that is to say, committing acts against her superior's authority and her co-employees violating the terms of her employment and engaging in immoral conduct that goes against its interest as a Christian institution. In their respective decisions, the LA, the NLRC, and the CA found the dismissal valid on the ground of loss of trust and confidence and serious misconduct. The LA and NLRC and the CA considered Zaida's act of maintaining her relationship with Marlon despite the implementation of the non-federalization policy, immoral act that is prejudicial to St. Vincent's interests and which amounted to serious misconduct. They also considered her failure to disclose the relationship as an act of dishonesty that willfully breached St. Vincent's trust. Willful breach of trust or loss of confidence as interchangeably referred to in jurisprudence and used in this opinion and serious misconduct are just causes for the dismissal of an employee under Article 282A and C respectively. Now Article 296 of the Labor Code. To justify the employee's dismissal on these grounds, the employer must show that the employee indeed committed acts constituting breach of trust or serious misconduct, which acts the court must gauge within the parameters defined by the law and jurisprudence. To place our discussions in proper perspective, 
the determination of whether Zaida was violently dismissed on the ground of willful breach of trust and serious misconduct requires the prior determination of, of first, whether Zaida's intimate relationship with Marlon was under the circumstances immoral. And second, whether such relationship is absolutely prohibited by or strictly required to be disclosed to the management under St. Vincent's non-paternization policy. We shall separately address these grounds in the discussions below. One, on the charge of immorality and engaging in conduct prejudicial to the interest of St. Vincent. We find the NLRC's findings of immorality or of committing acts prejudicial to the interest of St. Vincent to be baseless. Baseless. A. The totality of the attendance circumstances must be considered in determining whether an employee's conduct is immoral. Immorality pertains to a course of conduct, conduct that offends the morals of the community. It connotes conduct or acts that are willful, flagrant, or shameless, and that shows indifference to the moral standards of the upright and respectable members of the community. Conducts described as immoral or, or disgraceful refer to those acts that plainly contradict accepted standards of right and wrong behavior. They are prohibited because they are detrimental to the conditions on which depend the existence and progress of human society. Notwithstanding this characterization, the term immorality still escapes precise definition. The determination of whether it exists or has taken place depends on the attendant circumstances prevailing norms of conduct and applicable laws. In other words, it is, a, the, it is the totality of the circumstances surrounding the conduct per se as viewed in relation with the conduct generally accepted by society and as respectable or moral, which determines whether the conduct is disgraceful or immoral. The determination of whether a particular conduct is immoral involves one, a consideration of the, totality of the totality of the circumstances surrounding the conduct, and two, an assessment of these circumstances in the light of the prevailing norms of conduct, that is to say, what the society generally considers moral and respectable, and of the applicable laws. B, in dismissal situations, the sufficiency of a conduct claimed to be immoral must be judged based on secular, not religious standards. In determining whether the acts complained of constitute, quote, disgraceful and immoral, end quote, behavior under the civil service laws, the distinction between public and secular morality on the one hand and religious morality on the other hand should be kept in mind. The distinction as expressed, albeit not exclusively in the law on the one hand and religious morality on the other, is important because the jurisdiction of the court extends only to public and secular mor morality. In this case, we note that both Zaida and Marlon at all times had no impediments to marry each other. They were adults who met at work, dated, fell in love, and became sweethearts. The intimate sexual relations between them were consensual. consensual born by their love for one another and which they engage in discreetly and in strict privacy. They continued their relationship even after Marlon death St. Vincent in 2008. And they took their marriage vows soon after Zaida recovered from her miscarriage, thus validating their union in the eyes of both men and God. All these circumstances show the sincerity and honesty of their relationship between Zaida and Marlon. They also show their genuine regard and love for one another, a natural human emotion that is neither shameless, callous, nor offensive to the opinion of the upright and respectable members of the secular community. While their actions might not have strictly conformed with the beliefs, ways, and mores of St. Vincent, which is, which is governed largely by religious morality or with the personal views of its officials, these actions are not prohibited under any law 
nor are they contrary to conduct generally accepted by society as respectable or moral. Significantly, even the timeline of the events in this case supports our observation that their intimate relations was founded on love, viz. Zaida and Marlon met in 2002 and soon became become sweethearts. St. Vincent adopted the non-fraternization policy in September 2006. Marlon resigned from St. Vincent in July 2008. In February 2009, Zaida had the miscarriage that disclosed to St. Vincent's Zaida's relationship with Marlon. And St. Vincent terminated Zaida's employment in May 2009. Clearly from the timeline, Zaida and Marlon have long been in their relationship for about four years by the time St. Vincent adopted the policy. Their relationship by that time and given the turn of, of the events would have already been very serious. To be sure, no reasonable person could have expected them to severe their relationship simply because St. Vincent chose to adopt non-fraternization policy in 2007. Uh, 2006, sorry. As Zaid aptly argued, love is not a mechanical emotion that can easily be turned on and off. This is the lesson Shakespeare impressed on us in Romeo and Juliet, a play whose setting antedated those of Marlon and Zaida by about 400 years. We thus reiterate that mere private sexual relations between two unmarried and consenting adults, even if the relations result in pregnancy or miscarriage out of wedlock and without more, are not enough to warrant liability for illicit behavior. The voluntary intimacy between two unmarried adults where both are not under any impediment to marry, where no deceit exists and which was done in complete privacy is neither criminal nor so unprincipled as to warrant disciplinary action. To use an example more recent than Shakespeare's, if the court did not consider the complaint acts in escritor immoral, more so should the court in the case not consider Saida's consensual intimate relationship with Marlon immoral.